Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, our Meet with Expert in Regional Anesthesia series, which the, is, it is the sixth webinar in our series. And my name is Nick. I'm the host today. Uh, first of all, it's my honor to have two experts today. One is our old friend, Professor Paul Kessler, and uh, I'm also very happy to welcome our new friend, Dr. Steve Copens from UC Leuven. And uh, in today's webinar, we are presenting two topics in two sections. The first one is how to prolong a peripheral nerve block by Professor Kessler. And the second topic is original blocks for hip fracture by Dr. Copens. So uh, first of all, please allow me to give you a brief introduction about our expert today. Professor Paul Kessler is broad certified in anesthesiology, critical care medicine, pain therapy, and uh, emergency medicine, and uh, was awarded for, for professorship in anesthesia in 1998. He received his specialty training in anesthesiology at the Johann Wolfgang Gotha University in Frankfurt, Germany. From 2003 to January 2020, he was chair of the Department of Anesthesiology, Intensive Care Medicine and the Pain Medicine of the Orthopedic University Clinic in Frankfurt, Germany. Since February 2020, Professor Kessler is vice chairman of the Clinic of Anesthesiology, Intensive Care Medicine and Pain Therapy of the University Hospital in Frankfurt. His clinical expertise focuses on regional anesthesia. Professor Paul Kessler has co-authored over 100 peer-reviewed papers, review articles, case reports, and book chapters. Professor Paul Kessler is a member of many national and international societies of anesthesia. From 2009 to 2014, he was chairman of the German Task Force of Regional Anesthesia. From 2009 to 2013, he was board, he was board member of the ESRA and from 2014 to 2018, he was the German Zone representative in the ESRA Council. He's currently the chair of the ESRA Cadaver Workshops. So welcome, Professor. And Thank then you. please allow me to introduce Dr. Steve Copen. Dr. Steve Copen obtained his medical degree at the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium in 1996. He completed his residency in anesthesiology in 2001 at the University Hospital of Leuven. He worked from 2001 until 2008 in private practice and developed his skill for regional anesthesia. From 2008 up to 2012, he worked in a level one trauma center in the Netherlands, where his main focus was on developing local regional standards and enhancing ultrasound skills. He was appointed member of staff in 2013 at the Department of Anesthesiology of the University Hospitals in Leuven. Belgium. Since 2013, he has been clinical director of regional anesthesia and was appointed associate head of clinic. He implemented a newly developed local regional learning program in Leuven and was instrumental in developing the regional anesthesia fellowship program. His PhD on enhanced recovery programs and the RA in thoracic and the major abdominal surgery is currently in progress. So as a member of the ESRA uh, scientific uh, committee, Dr. Copens gave numerous presentations and the abstracts at the ESRA meetings, as well as cadaver and the uh, ultrasound workshops since 2014. He also gives countless national and international lectures and uh, courses in ESRA, BARA, uh, 
ARA and uh, BSAR and uh, NISORA. And uh, if you have ever read the story of Dr. Copens on the ASRO website, you will know that Dr. Copen is a true hero during the COVID battle. So with, my, with our greatest respect, let's welcome Dr. Copens. And uh, just a little housekeeping before we can uh, get started to the webinar. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar, please make sure to type down here in the control panel QA box. And uh, we will um, start a QA section after the two topics uh, in the end of our webinar. And uh, now without further ado, I will turn the time over to Professor Kessler, please. So now I will. Yeah, now you can share the screen, please. Okay. Can you see the screen now? Yes. Yes, I can see it. Okay, so Nick, thank you very much for the nice introduction and good evening in Asia, dear colleagues, dear friends. The topic of my presentation today is how to prolong peripheral nerve blocks. And uh, these are my conflict of interest. I got honoraria from different uh, companies, but this will not influence my presentation of today. So these are the topics I'm going to talk about during the next, I think, 45 minutes. What is the role of peripheral nerve blocks in postoperative analgesia? Why should we prolong peripheral nerve blocks? What kind of options, what different options do we have to prolong peripheral nerve blocks? What are the pros and cons? And finally, I will give a short summary. So here you see the well-known benefits of peripheral nerve blocks. We don't need or we can reduce the amount of opioids and therefore the opioid effects. I think this is the most important issue. We can improve the quality of pain therapy, the patient satisfaction. We have an earlier functional return, for example, of the joint and bowels. We can discharge the patient earlier and we reduce the healthcare cost and likelihood also the chronic pain. If you uh, perform regional techniques, you should always do it in a multimodal analgesia concept, including non-opiates with the aim to reduce the amount of opioids. And here are some examples from, for each of regional techniques as part of the multimodal therapy for thoracotomy. You see, you can use local infiltration, regional techniques, and also neuro. Uh, neuraxial techniques, this is a paravertebral block for open laparotomy, it's a tap block. You can also use a QL block or something else. For total hip replacement, we will hear more in details from Steve. Here you see we have a lot of different uh, regional blocks we can use. For total knee, the same. There are many different blocks, femoral block, adductor canal, psoas, fascia, iliaca, and so on. For spine fusion, we can use a retrolaminar block or thoracolumbar interfacial plane block. And for cesarean injection, a tap block or iliuinguinal block or also a perforated fulgurum block. Regal techniques are also important if you want to perform ERAS uh, programs. ERAS means enhanced recovery after, after surgery. And the aim is the same. You will reduce or will, you will avoid the uh, opioids and therefore you will improve the recovery of the patient. And here's some uh, uh, evidence-based uh, publications where regional anesthesia was successfully implemented in an ERAS program, you see for colorectal surgery, hip. We also know that our orthopedists like the uh, uh, regional blocks. As you can see here, this is uh, one of the highest ranked publications uh, in, from, in orthopedics. And uh, they stated that for lower extremity, peripheral nerve blocks are becoming a mainstay in perioperative pain therapy. And this is an example for total knee atroplasty. This was a uh, public a meta-analysis, including 170 randomized controlled drives. And they, the question was, which is the best option for pain management after total knee atroplasty? And uh, the best combination was a femoral and sciatic nerve block. But this was only focused on pain therapy. In the meantime, we know uh, orthopedists and also surgeons expect more than only pain relief when we do regional blocks. For example, if we 
uh, to block for major knee surgery, an early mobilization is also requested. And we are doing from decades uh, different blocks. We started with the lumbar epidurals, then lumbar plexus, and we moved downwards more distally up to a ductal canal and LIA technique. This is for the front side and also for the back side. We started with proximal sciatic nerve blocks, and we moved also more distally to a distal sciatic popliteal plexus or IPEC block. And if we do so, we move more distally, we reduce the quadriceps or the, 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 the weakness of the hamstrings, and this allowed earlier mobilization. And if you do now an ARAS program for major hip surgery, so you should focus and recommend it are only the more distal blocks, LIA block or IPEC block for this kind of operation. But uh, it always depends on your local environment of the policy of the hospital and all, all of the reimbursement of the healthcare insurance, what kind of uh, regional block you uh, give for a major knee surgery. Is analgesia more prominent or is it to uh, send the patient home at the same day or will you uh, handle the patient opioid free? And other also important issues are today uh, uh, very relevant. For example, the post-operative rate of delirium in elderly patients. And you can see here, these are recommendations from the ESRA Society. And to optimize post-operative pain control can reduce the risk of post-operative delirium. And this means to avoid or to reduce the amount of opiates and to focus more on regional anesthesia or regional blocks, can, uh, then you can follow this goal. Have some indications, for example, here too. If you the fascia iliaca block for hip fractures, this can decrease the delir the rate of delirium, and also if you do a femoral nerve block for total knee replacement. Another strong argument, I think, for uh, for peripheral nerve blocks is the opioid epidemic or opioid abuse worldwide. As you know, it is or it was in the United States a real big problem. And one of the major reasons is uh, why you became a new opioid user is after a major and even after a minor operation, you can see here up to 10% and more after, kind, after any kind of operations, there are uh, patients become a new persistent opioid user. And why this is so, or it was so in the United States, you see here that and, uh, this was uh, depends on the prescribing policy. You see here, the number of oxycodone uh, tablets uh, which were given to the patients after they were sent home. And you see here in red, after total hip arthroplasty, the patient received 30 oxycodone tablets and after nodal, for, after nodal T, knee arthroplasty, when he was sent home, 50 uh, oxycodone tablets. This was would be impossible in Germany, and it's not surprising that after such a kind of operation, we have new opioid users. So cut opioid prescriptions, focus more and more on original techniques. This is very important. And here another example how peripheral nerve blocks can improve the uh, patient's outcome. You see here a, ret a ret retrospective cohort study a national database from Steve Mapsudis. He is very active in this field. You see a huge number of patients, more than 700,000 for knee, uh, total knee arthroplasty and the opioid consumption, consumption could be reduced and also the pulmonary outcome could be improved in these patients. So I have shown you many, and this is a study including nearly 15 1,500 patients with different operations, upper and lower extremity, thoracic, upper abdomen, lower abdomen. And you can see on, day, on the first day after the operation, the, the VAS score was between, uh, higher than 40, was between 6 and 20% of the patient. That means that many of these patients suffered severe pain on uh, the first post-operative day. You see here, single shots can reduce the OP amount, but also with peripheral nerve blocks, we can reduce the uh, opioid use and we, is, uh, we can uh, more satisfy the patient. So how can we prolong the duration of peripheral nerve blocks? More than maybe 12 hours. We can first, we have different options. We can use long-acting local anesthetics. We can 
uh, use additives, or we can use new kind of formulation of local anesthetic with an extended release up to 72 hours, or we can redo a single shot on the next day or the second day after the operation, or finally, we can use perineal catheters. So, first of all, what kind of uh, local anesthetic can we use? We can use long-acting local anesthetics. And if we have, uh, uh, if, we are sp sp spoke, if I speak of long-acting local anesthetics, there are only three that we have, ropivacaine, bupivacaine, and levopropivacaine. And you can see the duration of analgesia is up to 24 hours. But disadvantages of long-acting local anesthetic is always, you always have a sensory and a combination of sensory and motor block. And uh, what about the additives, the adjuvants to prolong the local anesthesia effect? So we have a lot of different kinds of drugs. You can see here, this is not the total list, but these are the most common drugs. But you have to keep in mind, this, this except of adrenaline or ephedrine, all of them are used off-label and to uh, take the, the, uh, the allowance of the patients when you want to give these drugs. And those drugs on the right side, bicarbonate, ketamine, magnesium, neosigmine, mysolol, I would never recommend to use these drugs because we have only little data on this and there's also, uh, always a question of neurotoxicity. So we, you should focus when we are spoken on additives on the left-hand side, adrenaline, opioids, dexamethasone, and the alpha-2 agonists. Again, the same what applies for long-acting also applies for the additives. They also uh, prolong the sensory and motor block. First of all, adrenaline. Adrenaline, I think, is the most commonly administered, uh, administered additives. Uh, we, the indication is, first of all, we want to detect an intravascular uh, local anesthetic injection, injection, and we can reduce the systemic or absorption uh, because the result absorption is reduced and we have a longer lasting effect. The mechanism is mediated by an alpha-1 adrenergic vasoconstriction. When you use uh, ropivacaine, it's not necessary to combine ropivacaine with epinephrine because uh, this is not a, will not increase the ropivacaine effect significantly because ropivacaine has a, an intrinsic properties, vasoconstrictive properties, and therefore, there is no additional effect when you add adrenaline. Here is a meta-analysis, including six studies for local regional anesthesia, uh, 200 patients. And with uh, the uh, addition of uh, adrenaline, you can uh, increase or prolong the analgesia and motor block at a maximum of 60 minutes. So if you summarize, what about adrenaline perineurally? I would not recommend routinely, or this is the policy all the time, we do not use uh, routinely uh, adrenaline, uh, but, and you have to think uh, if you use uh, it in, in, in areas where you have impaired peer blood flow, it's, always, it's also not recommended. We, but we routinely use it when we give large for example, from interfacial plane block, especially when you do these interfacial plane blocks bilaterally, or when you have a patient, a trauma patient, where you do a double or a triple block. Opioids, I think there is uh, absolutely, it's proven that there is a neuroaxial mechanism in the substantia gelatinosa of the dorsal horn of the spinal cord release, but in normal tissue, in regular tissue, I don't think that we have a lot, or if there are uh, opiate receptors, uh, present. And therefore, we also have conflicting data. You see here uh, 15 studies, eight with uh, pros and seven with negative results. And uh, the conclusion here, if you look at the positive uh, of the positive uh, studies, there will always drive lower quality and the well-performed drives showed no evidence that there is an, uh, an, any beneficial effects when you add opioids to low blood. So we can summarize, yeah, we have inconclusive data, probably we see in systemic mediated effects by opioids and my recommendation to opioids to for parallel blocks, I would never recommend this. Dexamethasone, the next drug, it's an anti-inflammatory drug. Uh, 
uh, if there is a perineural mechanism, we have a lot of uh, in vitro and animal data. Neurotoxicity, I think, is no longer this problem uh, because when you use preservative free preparations, uh, these uh, preparations are not neurotoxic. Here, this is very important. You can see if you add uh, uh, 10 milligram dexamethasone intravenously or perineurally, you see you have a similar, the same prolongation compared to pure raw pivacaine. And uh, this study analyzed in a more detail, and they could find when you give the same amount of dexamethasone uh, perineurally uh, and intravenously, you, you have a longer, uh, around 20% longer duration when you add uh, dexamethasone perineurally. And what we also can see, there's a dose dependent effect if you give dexamethasone intravenously, if you give 1.25, 2.5, or 10 milligram, you can see an increased duration of the effect. This review article included nearly 20, uh, 30 trials, uh, 1,600 patients. And if you give dexamethasone perineurally, you have for short acting uh, drug uh, local anesthetics and four hour extension, and for long acting local anesthetics, an eight hour extension. So, in summary, as we see uh, a similar effect when we give dexamethasone intravenously, I would recommend to use uh, dexamethasone only intravenously. You can see, you, you know, we give it also routinely uh, to prevent PONF in our patients. Next one is clonidine. It's an alpha-2 agonist. We, there is a neuroaxial mechanism proven. If there is a pair of peripheral effects, we don't know exactly. We only have animal and in vitro data. The dose range between 50 and 155. And uh, if you increase the dose over 100, you see more pronounced side effects. This is a meta-analysis, 20 trials, looking what happens with clonidine when it was added to local anesthetics. You can see here for intermediate local anesthetics, you have an increase of nearly 150 minutes. If you use it added to long acting, you have an uh, effect of 152 minutes regarding the, the analgesia. And also when you look at the motor blockade, you have an increase of 109 and 159 minutes when you added uh, this to long acting local anesthetics. But you also see the typical side effect profile of alpha 2 agonists, arterial hypotension, bradycardia, and also sedation. So in conclusion, I would say uh, perineural clonidine can be uh, recommended, but you again you have a uh, combination of sensory and motor block and extension of two hours. And you have to think of the side effects when you increase the dose. Finally, dexmedetomidine. This is a pure alpha-2 agonist. It also has a proven neurexone mechanism. The dose range between 20 and 150, the same side effect profile. Uh, clonidine, here for interscaline vexus block, you can increase with 150 microgram dexmedetomidine uh, the robivacaine duration from 14 to 18 hours. Again, if you give it dexmedetomidine IV, you have an increased duration of 10%, but if you give the same amount perineurally, you have an increase of the duration of 60%. This is a meta-analysis showing that uh, you will increase this uh, uh, dexmedetomidine, the motor block about 60% and the duration of analgesia uh, in the same way. So uh, the conclusion of the authors is benefits should be weighted against increased risk of motor block prolongation and motor block. So finally, adrenaline, uh, perineurally, clonidine, dexmedetomidine, perineurally, and dexamethasone should be given in to prolong the uh, peripheral nerve blocks. What about new formulations with an extended release? And very well known is the liposomal bupivacaine. Do you have here encapsulated bupivacaine molecules which are released over a time of 72 hours into the perineal tissue? And this was a uh, very uh, excellent a study for interscaline drugs uh, comparing standard bupivacaine with a combination of standard bupivacaine and liposomal bupivacaine, and they could demonstrate that liposomal bupivacaine may lower pain scores and enhance uh, patient satisfaction. This was published in 2017 and in 2018, 
the FDA gave the approval for uh, liposomal bupivacaine for interscaline plexus block. Of course, liposomal bupivacaine is originally uh, uh, approved for uh, surgical site uh, injection. But in February this year, liposomal bupivacaine covered the front page of anesthesiology, and you can see the result of meta-analysis. Perineal liposomal bupivacaine is not superior to non-liposomal bupivacaine, bupivacaine for peripheral nerve block analgesia, and nine trials were included with more than 600 patients. The authors found, and this is interesting, that liposomal bupivacaine statistically significant increased the, uh, uh, the pain uh, the area under the curve for post-operative pain, but this was only by one centimeter. And uh, uh, clinical significance is defined as at least a two centimeter difference in the VAS, for example. And this was only one centimeter, so the conclusion of the authors was the, we have uh, high quality evidence that uh, that liposomal bupivacaine uh, does not support the use of this drug for peripheral nerve blocks. And you have to keep in mind, you have a delayed onset with this drug and you have some side effects, you should also keep in mind. And for example, the main reason why this uh, drug is not successful in Germany, these are the costs. You can see the cost for plane and for on the left side and for uh, uh, liposomal bupivacaine uh, this is the reason why it has only little chance to be used uh, in Germany. But there is another very interesting uh, drug, this is called HTX011, which also is a novel extended release drug. But this is a combination of Rebivacaine and uh, low dose myloxacam. This is a non sterile anti inflammatory drug. As you know, when you do a surgical incision, you have a release from cytokines. And this uh, will end in a decrease in the pH. And you know, with a de uh, decreased pH, there are lower, uh, lower amount of lipid solo uh, local anesthetic molecules, which can penetrate the nerve membrane. And therefore, less local opioids can block the nerves. And with the addition of a uh, uh, meloxicum, you block the cytokine release and you normalize the pH with the result that more and more local anesthetics can enter the, the, the nerve membrane and can block the nerves. And this is, could be nicely demonstrated in a PIC uh, studies. You can see here the blue bars are the, the pH of the new drug combination and the orange of the sham. And you can see you have a higher pH with the new drug and the more a higher percentage of bupivacaine is available to enter the nerves. And this also results in a higher and more pronounced analgesic effects. Here you can see on the x-axis the time scale, on the y-axis you can see the percentage of maximal force tolerated. And the blue bars represent the liposomal bupivacaine. And you can see after one day, up to three days, you have only a, a tolerance of 10 to 30 to 20% where the new drug, these are the gray bars, you tolerate 100% of the maximum force. And as a result of this, in May 21, the FDA approved this new combination uh, for uh, soft tissue or periarticular installation for uninonectomy, open ingual hernia, raffi, and for total neatroplasty nerve uh, uh, application. The second or another option to uh, to increase the duration of our local anesthetics on the peripheral nerve blocks is you can do a re-single shot. And I know some colleagues uh, from Denmark, especially, they only do single shots. And when, if the patient has a severe pain on the second day, or the first or second day after the operation, they would read you a single block. Uh, but you have to keep in mind, sometimes there is a, the patient uh, has a cast or has a, a large bondage and you have to remove this, and sometimes also the injection uh, of the local anesthetics is probably close to the operation site, and this could sometimes be a contraindication for the reblock. And finally, we have the perineal catheters. This is the first uh, publication in 1946 of an, uh, 
You see here the needle of a needle which was fixed in the supraclavicular area with a cork and with plaster stripes here. But now we do it in a different way. Here, this again, a study showing that if you use a femoral catheter, you have on the first and second day during rest and ex exercise lower pain scores compared to a single shot when you add opioids or other uh, analgesics on the second and third day. Another uh, benefit of a uh, peripheral catheter is that you can improve the short term functional outcome. Here you see an interscaline block and the elevation and the external rotation of the shoulder is improved. These are the magenta bars when you have a continuous interscaline block compared to a single uh, interscaline block. And therefore, also, the Aero Society recommends for major shoulder surgery, arthroplasty, an interscaline catheter. This study I showed you very shortly before, you can see here a meta-analysis including more than 30 studies comparing single shot with continuous peripheral nerve blocks. You can see with uh, catheters, you have an improved pain control, decreased need for opioids, less nausea, greater pair dissection. Uh, and a better short-term functional outcome. What about the long-term functional outcome? You see here, um, this is a Cochrane uh, analysis, including six randomized controlled trials regarding uh, uh, hip replacement. And what they found is that uh, the degree of knee flexions after three or six months was not different if, you had, if the patient had a continuous femoral nerve block or had no block. Uh, for the operation. So there is no improvement, sorry, there is no improvement in the long-term functional outcome. This is a little bit frustrating for the uh, regional enthusiasts, regional block enthusiasts, but uh, this is a fact. There's no improvement in the long-term functional outcome. Where could we use peripheral nerve blocks? I would say every, in every area where we, can do, where we can do a single shot, we also can use a catheter, in the scalene area for shoulder, infraclavicular, provertebral, erector spine, serratus anterior, quartetus lumborum, fascia iliaca, femur triangular ductal canal, and so on. This list is not complete, but you can see there are many options where you can place a peripheral catheter. Peripheral catheter are also sometimes a better option uh, against epidurals because you can have the sim similar analgesia, but an improved hemodynamic stability. And uh, with peripheral blocks, sometimes you have a better risk benefit in this profile because uh, in, uh, if you place epidural catheters, there's always discussion about anticoagulation. And also there are data showing that continuous peripheral nerve blocks are in, uh, shown improved analgesia, uh, superior analgesia compared to wound catheters. This is the case for shoulder and knee surgery with interscalation. So what are the indications and what are patient selections? You see indications for catheters, for me, the major indications, you can prolong an excellent postoperative analgesia. You can use also catheters for, if you use the uh, peripheral nerve block as a sole anesthetic, probably for digit, digit transfer or replantation or limb salvage, you can use catheters and you can prolong the anesthesia. Also, for you can induce a sympathectomy and vasodilation, and this is what we use routinely in our uh, when we use uh, popliteal catheters for lower limb surgeries in the patients with. Uh, there are also, some uh, special patients where uh, peripheral nerve catheters have beneficial effects. These are when we want to avoid opioids in obese patients or in patients with obstructive sleep apnea in elder patients or in difficult pain situations when we have patients and opiate dependent patients or tolerant patients, chronic pain patients, or patients who uh, uh, show, said that has a poorly controlled uh, post-operative pain in former operations, and also in neuropathic pain. But we have a lot of limitations, you are also familiar with this, of peripheral nerve catheter. We have, this is the failure rate. We have a failure rate between 10 to 40%. This depends on where you place your catheter. The failure rate is higher when you have uh, superficial catheters, for example, in the endoscopic area, they have, you have a dislocation rate. 
we speak from primary prot failure when you cannot place the needle correctly or when you cannot advance the catheter or you cannot see the distribution of the local anesthetic and of secondary prot failure we spoke mainly when we have a catheter dislodgements. Regarding the needle placement, I think there is a uh, general agreement becoming more and more pronounced that ultrasound guidance is superior to nerve stimulation. You see here we have a higher success rate, faster block on the less, we need less local anesthetics, but there is no difference in nerve injury up to now. And here now some aspects which how you can improve your catheter, for example, should we expand this perineal space in front of the cannula? This is a study showing that if you give 10 ml before you uh, advance your before you introduce your catheter, you have a higher success rate. But there are also other studies showing if you open the perineal space before you place your catheter, there is no benefit. In our department, I usually uh, expand the perineal space with. Uh, with sodium or with a local anesthetics before I advance the catheter. When we advance the catheter, should we do it blindly or are there other techniques? You can see here, this was an ultrasound guided block. I placed the, the, the probe here and now I advance the catheter blindly. If you advance the catheter blindly and the tip is close to the nerve, you will have a well working block. But as you don't know how where the catheter is uh, placed, Sometimes you have a not well working block because the tip is far away from the nerve. So to reduce or minimize the risk of a, a not working catheter, you should not insert the catheter too deeply. Otherwise, the, you don't know exactly where the, the catheter tip is. For upper extremity, we only advance the catheter two to three centimeters. For lower extremity, sometimes up to five. Is ultrasound helpful? There are different options first, how you can perform ultrasound guided block, nerve in short axis or in long axis, in plane and out of plane. But we have only some data. Is in, of, in plane or out of plane better uh, for catheter, uh, for a well-working catheter? Here, if you look, is it a publication regarding media catheter? If you advance the catheter in an out of plane technique, means you advance the catheter along the nerve, you have a very low failure displacement rate, dislocation rate, and if you do it out of plane, as you can see here, the dislocation rate is higher. But we have only data, when you look at the femoral nerve, uh, it could be demonstrated that here is an in-plane approach more successful compared to an out-of-plane approach. What about, uh, I think the most important is to know where is the catheter tip and to find out where the catheter tip is. You can use ultrasound and you, and you can see where is the local anesthetic spreading. Sometimes I use color and sometimes I agitate the fluid so that we have very small bubbles in the local anesthetics. And when I inject now the local anesthetics, I can see the small bubbles as hyperechoic white spots in the ultrasound image. This, this sometimes helps to identify the tip of the catheter. Does the catheter design play a, a role? I think for a peripheral nerve block, we always use an end hole or the three hole uh, catheters like here. Maybe for interfacial plane blocks, multi-hole catheter, as you can see here, are uh, more uh, appropriate because the local anesthetic can spread smoother and more flat in the interfacial plane. Dressings, we know with dressings, we ha have a higher dislocation rate, but tunneling is, I think, is too much for a catheter, which is maybe only one or two days in the patient. Motor weakness is an uh, issue for lower limb blocks. We know many uh, case reports of uh, falls after femoral nerve catheter, but we also have uh, several publications where it could be demonstrated, as you can see here in this publication, before the catheter, when the, as long as the femoral uh, nerve block catheter was in the patient, there was a low rate of falls. After the removal of the femoral nerve catheter, the number of falls increased. But uh, I think uh, you have also keep in mind, uh, after many, uh, in the first two or three days, mo uh, mobilization is not so improved. Uh, 
an issue only after a few days, the patients walk more and more, and then also the risk of fall is increased. But we have to keep in mind, inpatient falls does not occur after single injections. Mainly, re main reason is because uh, in the first few hours, the patient will not move extensively. But during infusion, we see we have case reports. And if you uh, uh, have a well done randomized control trials, you can see you have an increased risk uh, of fall with an uh, continuous femoral nerve block uh, on about, the risk ratio is about four. So there, is, uh, there seems to be a causal, causal relationship between false and perineal infusions. How can we minimize the risk? If you do a more distal block, if you uh, use catheter with lower concentrated local anesthetics, or if you avoid any catheter. Catheter-related complications, uh, only a few slides on this. Infection is not really an option. We know that we have a high rate of colonization if we check the catheter, but really a real severe systemic infection, the rate is extremely low. The uh, infection rate will increase the longer the uh, catheter is in the patient. When we admit the patient to the ICU, we know there are some areas with a higher rate of infections in the axillary or femoral area. This is the reason for this is because this is a wet area. We have a lot of uh, sweat glands here in the axillary area. If we have a, a frequent change of dressing, this also increases the rate of infection. And if you know, uh, if you have no prophylactic antibiotics, also increases the rate. So this is a uh, catastrophic complication. This patient died. This was a young patient with a shoulder surgery, and the catheter was advanced intrathecally, and this was not. Uh, detected firstly only uh, in the first night when the patients have pain and for the first time a bolus was injected in the catheter and uh, after the injection the, the anesthesiologist removed from the patient in the normal ward and the next morning the patient was found dead in the bed. So uh, you should not advance the uh, catheter too far away, uh, too deep. And uh, if you give an injection, every injection should be a test injection, and you have to stay on the patient at least for 20, 30 minutes to, che to check what happens. So my last, or my, nearly my last slide, I will summarize how can we prolong the duration of peripheral nerve blocks. We have long-acting local anesthetics. The disadvantage is we cannot adjust the local anesthetics, so we will always have a sensor and motor weakness, and this is sometimes... Uh, um, drawbacks because uh, sometimes immediately post-operatively the surgeons want to check the motor function uh, if there happens uh, nerve injury by the operation and this cannot be the case. This cannot is not possible when you have a long-acting uh, local anesthetic and the, the the local anesthetic will have an effect at a maximum of 24 hours. Adjuvants also. Uh, most of them are off-label, and you have, again, a prolongation of sensory and motor function, and the same that applies for long-acting applies for adjuvants. New formulations, only liposomal bupivacaine has an uh, approval, and only for interscaline block, and you have seen there is no superiority uh, to pure bupivacaine. We have side effects, and I think it's very expensive. You can uh, do a second puncture on the second or third day, but uh, there are hygiene aspects. And if you have ambulatory cases, so the patient can come to the hospital only uh, for a second uh, block. Perineal catheters are sometimes a short acting local anesthetic, so that the, the, the motor function is preserved after the operation. You can change the local anesthetics, you can change the concentration, you can adjust the dose. You can use a patient-controlled mode, which is also the Mercedes under the, the, the techniques. But you have high costs. You need an acute pain service who take care of who is taking care of the catheters. You can see there's a failure rate up to 40 percent, and there are some side effects. So finally, I have showed you there are many roads leading to Rome, and what way you are choosing it depends on you. It depends on your special situations in your department, in your hospitals. And uh, you have cheaper, uh, cheaper techniques, you have more expensive techniques, you have better techniques, and you have not so good techniques. So, but you have a 
lot of uh, different techniques you can choose and it depends on you. Thank you very much. Steve, it's your turn now. I think you have to open your uh, audio, your, your micro. You have to open your micro. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, okay. okay. So I will try to share my presentation now. This okay? Everybody seeing this? Okay. Good. Um, thank you for uh, for joining me uh, in this uh, lecture, and thank you, uh, Paul, for a, an excellent uh, speech. Uh, uh, a lot of things which I uh, absolutely agree upon, uh, and I might come back on some of those topics as well. Uh, so thank you for Wysonic uh, for organizing this. Uh, I work in the UZ Leuven, which is one of the biggest hospitals uh, in, in Western Europe and in Belgium, certainly more than 2,000 beds. Uh, it's a third tertiary uh, referral center. Uh, and I thank Wysonic uh, for uh, giving the ability to, to show this presentation because uh, I get uh, funded for my fellows and I, I added a couple of uh, pictures on all the equipment my fellows get. Uh, we also here we visited uh, Professor Hatzic in Nizora in Zoll. So with uh, here Jeff Gadsden visited with uh, fellows from the United States from, from Duke. So we have a, an exchange fellowship as well. So uh, again, thank you for Wissonic for making uh, this happen. So um, first of all, if I want to talk about something regional specific, I will uh, usually quote Alon Winnie, uh, and, and I've quoted him a million times already, but I, I think it's completely right that uh, you need to know anatomy before you want to do any regional anesthesia. And I think it's more important nowadays with ultrasound than it used to be with uh, with uh, landmarks even because uh, we need we see more and we need to understand more because uh, it's so uh, interesting and important and I still do some workshops as well where I uh, uh, still show landmark based ultrasound guided uh, blocks because that in some countries uh, they don't always have the uh, opportunity to have ultrasound so. Uh, it's very fun to do that still and know the landmarks and put them on a model. As you can see here, uh, he wasn't too, uh, too uh, worried about that afterwards. He could uh, get it off. So uh, if I want to talk about uh, the, the hip joint uh, and all the regional options there, you need to go into uh, detail about the anatomy, like I just said. And luckily for me, uh, just this uh, year, uh, an update uh, review article in pain medicine uh, in February 2021. It's actually a very great read. I had uh, added some QR codes for people who want to use their uh, quick scan with the uh, uh, smartphone and you can immediately go to that. It's a very extensive review on uh, all the, the innovation. This is a picture from that review. A uh, nice picture which uh, actually shows uh, the important at the left side, uh, and you can see immediately that the femoral and the obturator uh, are very, very important, and also are are densely uh, uh, densely uh, aware there uh, of uh, nociceptors at the uh, anterior side, and you can see that really nice at the, at the, that left uh, picture. But of course, the backside also the sciatic gives with the superior gluteal and inferior gluteal some. Uh, uh, coverage as well, but it's nearly uh, uh, not as impressive as the anterior side. And if you go more into detail in the anterior side, you can see it's uh, several branches there. Uh, and uh, uh, again, very, uh, uh, very difficult anatomy. If you really want to know where they're all running, uh, the uh, accessory obturator nerve, 
etc., uh, etc. Et but we'll go a little bit more in detail there. Uh, and I think this this picture also is very interesting. And and I'll come back to Peng block a little bit later. But this this uh, this picture is very interesting when you reconsider the Peng block because you have that um, that beautiful uh, view there with with all the nerves there. And and we'll come back on that later. Okay. So we have anatomy. So. What about guidelines? Do we actually need blocks for hip uh, surgery? And that's another question. Well, there are a couple of guidelines. If you uh, look at the guidelines, and again, I'm, I'm really lucky. It's uh, from 2021 from, uh, from the prospect work group where my uh, chief, uh, Professor Van der Velde also worked on. Uh, and um, actually, they're pretty okay. Of course, this is about total hip arthroplasty. Mind you, there is a difference between hip fractures, of course, and arthroplasty, which are usually primary uh, elective cases and fractures or trauma. Uh, you have to distinguish them. But if you look at total hip arthroplasty, so uh, uh, elective cases, they still recommend uh, at least some regional anesthesia, and they actually also recommend only one. Uh, and that's a single shot fascia aliaca block, or, and there you have it, they also recommend LIA, local infiltration analgesia. And that's my point that uh, for total hip arthroplasty, probably you don't need a lot of regional anesthesia anymore, which makes my uh, job a little bit hard if I want to talk about all the regional uh, uh, possibilities, but uh, I'll get you through all the other things because there is more than total hip arthroplasty. There is trauma, there are hip fractures, of course, and I added the QR code here again. And they also recommend either spinal or general, although there is some evidence that spinal might be uh, a little bit better. The evidence is hardly overwhelming, uh, and I think you're you're okay with uh, with either case, depending on patient to patient. Uh, if you go to the NICE guidelines, uh, and that's also pretty recent from uh, last year, they're much more stern to uh, regional anesthesia, to be honest, uh, and they only talk about LIA, and maybe you could consider a nerve block if it does not impair motor function and, and if it uh, does not delay uh, surgery significantly. And they actually even say that a block which delays surgery for more than five minutes uh, is probably not uh, recommended. So they're much more stern there. So depending on your guidelines for uh, joint replacement, there are two uh, different ideas on that. But again, you get the, the, the main message probably for a, a, a total hip arthroplasty for primary elective care, uh, regional anesthesia is not that important and maybe LIA more important and a fascia iliaca block at most because you want to be really motor sparing. But again, there are more uh, things than uh, elective care surgery. So we'll talk more about uh, fractures and trauma, of course. And if you go to fractures and trauma, I think the most um, uh, complete block of the hip is probably the psoas or lumbar uh, plexus compartment block. Uh, it's, uh, of course, already a, a block that, that's been around for, for years and years. And uh, you have, of course, still people who do it uh, blindly. Uh, and, and I got some nice pictures there. Of course, you can also do it with ultrasound, which I uh, absolutely recommend. Uh, but um, uh, you see, I added the picture with all the different uh, techniques from we impressive all the drawbacks. So there is potential epidural spread. Uh, you can have a total spinal anesthesia, Mild hypertension should occur because you're close to uh, the epidural uh, space, of course. Uh, plexopathy, systemic toxicity, of course, you have that always. But uh, even then, uh, retroperitoneal hematoma, renal puncture, it is a quite impressive list. So um, I won't go too much in detail. There are pretty good uh, 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 scientific uh, uh, papers on the so was a lumbar plexus compartment block, but I would actually say be careful with it. You need lots of experience. It is dangerous. You need a good positioning. 
Uh, and I would certainly not recommend it for primary total hip arthroplasty. Uh, I mean, if you use it for trauma elderly uh, or for hip fractures, uh, it can even provide complete anesthesia in addition with some sedation if you're very good at it. Uh, depending on your workplace, uh, you can still use it if you have lots of experience and you know what to do. So uh, I, with this, I would, I would, and I've did, done this a couple of times, I would like to launch a new concept. I think in different hospitals, different surgeons, different approaches and different experience, sometimes you cannot always say this is procedure specific, but it is all also center specific. So maybe they should uh, change the prospect into center procedure specific postoperative pain management. Anyway, so this is these are my recommendations for psoas lumbar or plexus compartment block. Of course, um, my lecture is a little bit more hands-on and practical, uh, although Paul Kessler's uh, uh, had an excellent speech. I'm going to go more into details on how to do it and a lot more uh, pictures on ultrasound, of course. And I wanted to go from... Uh, that uh, lumbar plexus to another block, which I think is very dangerous, uh, and it's the transmuscular uh, quadratus lumborum block adapted for, uh, 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 for possible hip. Uh, so it's not a transmuscular quadratus lumborum like you use for uh, abdominal surgery. And I added my uh, protocol, which we're now doing. And actually, I had to run while uh, Paul Kessler was doing his speech, I had to run and put in a, a TQL for my study. So I took off the camera for uh, 10 minutes while I was pricking. I'm at number 75 of 150. And of course, this is for laparoscopic colorectal surgery. But if you look at my picture, which are from our center, you can see that uh, where my needle is between quadratus lumborum and psoas major, at the bottom uh, uh, of that psoas major, uh, where you have the the... the the change from the vertebral body to the transverse process, you can actually really see the lumbar plexus. So uh, uh, the shamrock sign can be an, an, an excellent uh, vision for uh, the lumbar plexus. And uh, the shamrock lumbar plexus block has been recommended by some people. And there was an excellent paper by uh, Axel Sauter uh, and, and Thomas Benson and, and Jens Berklum on uh, how to perform it. And uh, of course, a little bit modified uh, from the transmuscular where you would uh, go up until the quadratus uh, in between the psoas. You now go a little bit lower until you don't see the transverse process anymore and then uh, go right to that spot, which I showed on my picture as well. But I would uh, say with the same uh, uh, remarks as with the lumbar plexus block, be very careful. D-block, retroperitoneal hematoma, uh, renal uh, puncture, uh, uh, chance of hematomas, etc. And if I go back uh, to, my, uh, to my study, we had a hematoma during one of our study patients, and you can see it was quite extensive. So be careful with that. And... If I'm going to talk about that, I, I could even go to, of course, another facial plane block, uh, and that's the lumbar ESP. Um, I, people who know me know that I'm not the biggest fan of ESP. Uh, and again, if I looked in the literature, a lot of uh, case reports, case reports from everywhere, but uh, not enough evidence to suggest that the lumbar ESP would be a good idea for hip surgery. And at this moment, I cannot recommend that case report, uh, initial experiences, etc. So summarizing for the shamrock, uh, we need more data. On the ESP, no solid evidence case reports need more data. I would say at this moment, I cannot recommend any of these techniques. So let's go to another older block. When we talked about lumbar uh, compartment block, let's go to a, another older block which is the femoral nerve block, which I still think is actually a very good uh, block. And, 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 and I sometimes feel bad because it's sometimes so discarded. It still uh, makes up um, uh, 40 to 50% and in some people, even 60% of the, the anterior side of the hip. So it is uh, still a very good uh, block if you, if you have no other options or you don't know how to perform fascia iliaca block. 
to do in hip fractures. Uh, and I would still recommend this for hip fracture, uh, especially in the ER. Uh, but again, it's not the easiest block because there are a lot of errors. And one of the, the most common errors is your probe is too uh, distal to the femoral artery bifurcation. You have a beautiful picture here uh, where you can see that if you're uh, too distal, sorry, uh, I go back. Uh, if you're too distal, then you can't really see the nerve anymore. You really need to see that nerve. Uh, and then you have to go scan up a little bit higher. A second error, which also happens a lot, is that you don't use the correct angle. I see a lot of people putting the ultrasound really, uh, uh, really wide like this, and they have to follow the inguinal crease, which is uh, much more sideways here, the, 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 the blue dot, uh, the blue line here. You have to follow that because otherwise you really can't see the nerve. So the wrong angle in relation to the femoral artery is a lot, uh, is a problem that we see a lot as well. Um, and my, uh, uh, my takeaway is here that uh, although it's supposed to be an easy block, I see lots of people struggle. Uh, it's a big nerve, uh, it divides very fast and it's extremely flat while you don't always see it. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to distinguish. Uh, it's also long, uh, borders are difficult to see. Uh, in some um, textbooks, it's even wrongly noted as the triangle next to the femoral nerve. Really bad idea. I'll show you a couple of pictures where people on the internet actually had it wrong. Uh, be careful for the arterial circumflex as well. And you can see it on my picture here. You can see the, the circumflex uh, coming out of the, the uh, femoral artery there, just above the femoral nerve. So be careful for that. Uh, anisotropy, uh, needle in wrong places. It's not the really uh, easiest block. And I added here a couple of pictures on, on what, what you can see on the internet, which is really bad. Um, uh, th this actually, this uh, uh, this uh, picture here, uh, actually the nerve is is that side, and they 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 completely show the nerve as completely here, while this is absolutely not the nerve, and here is the fascia iliaca, so this is the nerve. Um, I hope you can see my 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 uh, my uh, pointer, and otherwise I, I added the small yellow rec rectangle here, so the nerve is not the complete nerve, which they actually uh, think is there. Uh, and here it's actually even wrongly noted as the femoral nerve there, and it's actually probably underneath there or uh, much smaller anyway. Uh, so uh, to help you, you need a lot of tilting. You sometimes have to uh, have somebody who lifts the belly because the belly can be in the way, the abdomen. Uh, use long needles. Uh, the, the block should be placed very lateral because otherwise you'll go too steep. Uh, and avoid probe uh, pressure. I don't know, uh, can people say in chat if you actually can see this uh, video? Can you see this video? Can somebody say something in the chat? Then, yes, then I yes, guess. very good, very good. Okay. It's, I okay, can see good. it, very good. Perfect, then I'll play it again. Uh, I, I'll probably slip uh, uh, and skip a, a few of the things. But I, I'll, I'll keep this and actually it's very difficult to find the nerve and it's, it's very small here. Uh, and I can see a couple of black spots here, but it's very, very small and actually very difficult uh, to differentiate. Uh, and this is taken, uh, unfortunately, not with a high, uh, a high uh, resolution camera. It's just with an iPhone, somebody uh, taking uh, a video while I was performing the block. Um, but I'm adding uh, my needle here and that's this side, this is the nerve actually. And again, it's not really very, because people could think this is also nerve tissue, but actually this is the fascia iliaca here and only this is nerve, this is adipose tissue side. I'll skip a little bit more, adding some local anesthetic like that. And now you can see the fascia iliaca there. And actually now you just have to go underneath the nerve like this and then inject local anesthetic. And that is good. You shouldn't do anything more than this. Uh, people, uh, if you now inject your local anesthetic in this spot, everything is good. Uh, you, you don't need to do anything else, but uh, for didactic reasons and to show my, my, um, my fellows, I actually did uh, a thing that which I usually don't recommend is trying to get in between the fascia iliaca and the nerve. It's really difficult because I have to now 
lift my needle up. You can see me struggling a little bit. And then I have to really push against that fascia ilaca and then push. And then adding local anesthetic while I'm really pushing against the fascia ilaca. Once I try to get in there, I then add local anesthetic and then push again. And then you'll see the nerve peeling off. You see? And now you can see that nerve is a, is a complete uh, entity and not uh, uh, the triangle next to the artery, which is so wrongly noted in a lot of uh, pictures. So uh, uh, I, I think this is uh, interesting to see for, uh, for the people who are not really used to doing a lot of those blocks. I'll skip the rest of the video because um, uh, I think uh, uh, we've seen enough now. Oh, sorry. We'll go a little bit faster now through this. So uh, after I shown you the video, uh, we'll uh, yeah okay. We'll go to uh, a couple of other nerves which can be interesting because if you really want to only do femoral uh, nerve block, you could even uh, inject uh, fifteen milliliters of uh, local anesthetic to your nerve block and actually go separately to the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. And as you noted in my uh, anatomy uh, 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 part, there wasn't really an addition to the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve for the hip joint, but it uh, gives sensory uh, 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 innervation to the side, which can be very interesting if they do surgery there. So you could uh, uh, addition that uh, next to the femoral uh, uh, nerve block. And it's actually not so difficult. You only have to position a little bit your uh, uh, ultrasound a little bit more to the side and then go, and this is the femoral nerve here. If you now go move uh, alongside the femoral uh, crease, the inguinal uh, ligament, you will come to that side and you actually see the, the, the insertion of the sartre muscle. And uh, actually the, 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 the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve uh, runs at the top and then uh, at, at a little bit more distal at the side of the, the sartre muscle. And that sartre muscle is really easy to identify. You sometimes also see it's divided into two fascias. So it's really easy, uh, uh, black, uh, very bright. Uh, and, and actually the, 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 the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is not so difficult to identify. Uh, above it, and it's very uh, nicely noted here. So that's also an option. If you do femoral nerve, you could actually go separately to the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. And while we add it, uh, we, all, uh, we already had the femoral nerve, which is one of the most important. Why not go uh, also to the obturator nerve separately? Uh, well, it's a little bit more difficult. And, and I added this picture because I think it's such a nice picture. I wish I could drew, draw anatomy like that. Uh, I'm a good uh, drawer uh, and I usually uh, force my uh, residents uh, and fellows to be able to draw some of the anatomy, but not as nice as this here, of course. Uh, and, and you'll see the problem with the obturator nerve is actually most people know that the obturator nerve runs between the uh, adductor langus, uh, brevis and magnus. Uh, but the, the branch which goes to the hip joint is here above and it, it already separates uh, uh, much earlier. And that's the main problem of the obturator nerve. So uh, uh, that's the main point of focus. And, and, and like a normal obturator nerve block, which I sometimes do for uh, urological surgery, uh, you focus on uh, the anterior and, 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 and the posterior side of that, that obturator nerve, but actually you have to go a little bit higher. And if you go higher, you can follow, if you see my white line here, my yellow line here, you can follow the nerve structures and they come just above the obturator artery there. You really have to push your, your probe into the crease, follow it up and then inject there. And then cut block now, because this is the block which is supposed to get and the femoral nerve and the lateral cutaneous and the obturator. So that's interesting. Then I don't have to do it uh, uh, all separately like I showed now. So that would be very interesting. And then I'll talk a little bit about the pain block as well. I would all uh, invite you to go and, and look at the, the Wysonic uh, webinar, uh, which is uh, only uh, given last month, I think by Chris Vermeulen and, and Dr. Uh, Philip Peng himself, who are experts on those blocks. 
I, I'm going to go a little bit more practical because this webinar already tells all the story and I, I will be short of time anyway, but uh, it is recorded and you can see this and it's a very good webinar. I already saw it as well. Um, uh, so uh, if you go to the fascia iliaca block, you actually have a couple of options. You can have an infra-inguinal fascia iliaca block, but I would say um, this is not very interesting. Uh, it's just a, a femoral nerve block, which is not uh, your point of focus to inject local anesthetic here, but to go much more lateral, just underneath the sartory uh, muscle insertion. Um, and it probably uh, gives a good anesthesia of the femoral nerve, and it probably runs back uh, uh, to the side of the sartory and, and, and anesthetizes also the lateral cutaneous nerve, but you need a lot of volume and it will never ever give any obturator block. So it's only two in one. Um, so uh, I would say forget about that and go for the supra uh, inguinal fascia iliaca block or the, the CIFI or whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, and I think this, uh, this uh, paper by uh, uh, Peter Hebert was one of the first to describe it and it was really excellent. Uh, uh, article and I added a QR code here. So really read this. I think it was a brilliant read. And of course, some people have uh, already uh, gone on that research uh, further and, and especially Chris Remelin is there. And again, uh, this is very important. Distribution of dye underneath the fascia aliaca uh, also relates to the obturator nerve. And there we have it. We might, but not reliable, unfortunately, might even get uh, the obturator nerve, which we all want, of course. Then we have those three blocks in ones, uh, which which I tried to talk about. And uh, Chris Vermeulen did some nice research on that, uh, that it's a consistent spread more than the lumbar plexus even. So um, uh, there is a, a, a very good guide on how to do blocks on the ASRA. Uh, and these guys uh, showed how to do the fascia aliaca block because I see a lot of people struggle with that. It's actually the block which my fellows and my residents struggle most. Uh, my tip is that you really have to, to make a drawing of the, of the inguinal uh, ligament uh, of the ing in inguinal crease. And then you have to put your probe really uh, 90 degrees on that, like a, a straight uh, line on that. And then it's actually one third uh, of the way uh, next to the, the anterior uh, uh, crest here. So that's really uh, important to see. Uh, if you can find it, Azra, how to do blocks, supra-inguinal fascia iliaca blocks. Uh, uh, and these guys have a, an excellent teaching method on that with lots of pictures. I added it here uh, and you have to go look for the bow tie, which is <laughs> sounds very easy, but isn't always. And you actually have to uh, also uh, so what can help is finding uh, the artery there uh, and then uh, uh, the, the uh, abdominal muscle. Uh, and then you can uh, just inject underneath it. So again, I'll, I'll, I'll go to this uh, excellent webinar. So look at Peng and Peng Block. Um, I will try to, because I, a little bit, okay. I, I seem to forgotten, uh, but I will talk you through it. Uh, oh no, I added it here. Okay, so that's okay. So so uh, let's talk a little bit about the Peng because I'm, I'm running out of time already. Peng is of course the odd one out. It's a, it's a block which uh, is supposed to uh, really go to, um, to the, 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 the pericapsular nerve, so not the big nerves, which would uh, even spare mo more motor function than uh, a CIFI. Uh, and so it's, it's really uh, at this moment the hype. I, I think I know that a lot of people are using it uh, and I think it's a very interesting block, especially um, be deep and abdominal muscles can be hard to define in obese patients. Uh, and that's why fascia iliaca block superinguinal is not always easy. And then a pain block could actually be an alternative. And uh, uh, again, uh, next to the obese patients, also with elderly, the fascia iliaca block can be a little bit difficult. Uh, because they have atrophied muscles. And so you can't always see the abdominal wall muscle. Uh, 
and also the fascia are really not as thick and dense and, 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 and definable as you would in, in, in those uh, pictures that the guys from Azra showed you. And so difficult to identify landmarks uh, could mean that a, a supra inguinal fascia alveolar block uh, is really difficult and you struggle with it. And then a pain block can really help because um, if you once you know how to scan and remember that first uh, picture which I showed where all uh, the nerves are running uh, at the bottom of uh, 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 the, 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 the capsule and, 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 and the whole uh, 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 skeleton. So it, it's really nice visible. You have to scan like this. This is a really nice uh, picture where you go uh, a little bit more distally and then uh, end up more proximally where you can really uh, see the femoral artery there where you see the tendon and you have to inject underneath that tendon really at the bottom of the ilium. Uh, it's actually, uh, you don't use any um, uh, any uh, method to, uh, in, in to detect uh, pressure because pressure is pretty high there. It's almost uh, an, an out of tendon block right underneath the tendon and almost uh, at the bone, which really uh, makes it really hard to inject. So you, you need to tell the nurse that they have to put a lot of force in there. That's also very interesting to to know. So I won't go much into detail because uh, Chris and, and, and Dr. Peng already uh, are given a lot of uh, uh, explanation about that. Uh, but we know that there is a lot of research coming out. And, and I added here, I, I just looked at clinical trials and there are uh, at least 10 or 20 uh, trials now uh, looking at the PEN versus the fascia iliaca block. And I added one or two uh, of the list, which were already uh, well underway. Uh, so um, we don't know exactly if PEN is going to be better, but it could be uh, the block to go. Uh, and certainly fascia iliaca supraguinal is also still a very good option. Uh, and then lastly, do we actually need blocks for hip surgery? <laughs> uh, for total hip arthroplasty, probably not. And actually I got a grant uh, last year um, for uh, a research which we are doing. Uh, uh, and, and this is actually great after uh, Paul Kessler's uh, speech that we actually, they called us from um, uh, an app, uh, an, uh, a company which has an app which follows the pain and the mobilization after total hip arthroplasty. And this app uh, is on the iPhone and all the people who received uh, total hip arthroplasty in our hospital actually send their data to this app and they, they fill in their VAS scores uh, and they fill also uh, the amount of steps they, they take uh, each day, which is automatically counted by the iPhone. And then that app gets that and they send it back to the orthopedic surgeon. We didn't know this. And actually they uh, uh, mailed us and said, oh, uh, your patients are so good. And I say, excuse me, who are you? Well, we're the guys from the app. App, we don't know anything about app. But anyway, we learned about that. And they said, well, you, uh, actually, you said Leuven is very good. Uh, what are you doing? We want to know your protocol. And actually, you said, we don't do any regional anesthesia for our uh, total hip arthroplasty because we stopped doing supraguinal fascia de block because we still had some motor deficit and our surgeon staying gasoline, he really wants a quick, very fast uh, uh, motorization. He doesn't want any effect at all. So we quit. We might mm, think about doing PENG, but we quit actually. Uh, and all we do is actually use high dose intravenous glucocorticoids because that's a little bit the new standard for ERAS and you know uh, some people have uh, advocated that um, and especially uh, Henry Kalit who's the godfather of uh, ERAS as well and we actually tried it as, uh, much high, uh, much better let's uh, investigate that so we actually got a grant for a investigating a placebo controlled double blind study where we inject or high dose uh, glucocorticoids or uh, normal uh, low dose glucocorticoids uh, together with placebo and we're uh, currently recruiting we're at uh, patient number 25 so very interesting what uh, is going to come out of that but do we actually need it for total hippoarthroplasty probably not Leah uh, and maybe 
uh, glucocorticoids. So uh, here's me in action, uh, unfortunately, not with the Visonic, we still don't have that, but with uh, lots of other uh, uh, ultrasounds, of course. Uh, again, uh, thank you to Visonic for my funding of fellows, much appreciated. We, you invest in the future, which is very interesting, and the future uh, are my fellows and are here, and uh, I have so many already, uh, uh, only a couple of pictures here. Okay, thank you for your attention, and uh, some questions now, I think. Thank you, Dr. Coppens, and uh, we do appreciate your, your time and your selfless sharing with us in our Dandelion College. And uh, I think uh, we can go on with the Q&A section. I noticed that we, you have already answered several questions, and uh, maybe we can pick some questions with uh, Professor yeah. Kessler. I can go to the questions. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, how long the catheter uh, needs to be in place. Uh, that's that's your question, I think. Yes, uh, it depends. depends. On, we have no, <laughs> if we have no strict protocol that we say the uh, the catheter has to be removed on the second day on the on the first day. It also depends on the uh, patient situation. If there is a uh, an opiate dependent patient or. A, chronic pain patient, in this patient, maybe we leave the catheter a little bit longer, uh, maybe for after major knee uh, atroplasty for, for three, five days. It depends on also how long the patients stay in the hospital. So we have no strict protocol to say we remove the catheter on the first day or we remove the catheter on the second day. It de always depends on the patient situation. This is a question from Pina from the Philippines. Hi, Pina. Nice that you join our meeting. She has a question to you, Steve. If you do a QL block, uh, uh, transmuscular QL block for hip surgery, what is the local anesthetic that you use and what is the dose? Have you any catheters in uh, QL for hip? No. I, I, I haven't done uh, any catheters yet, but it is possible, uh, I think. But I would be very careful because if you see that picture, you know, you see the lumbar plexus and you know it's coming right from the vertebral body underneath the transfer process. So if you don't see your catheter too well, it could just migrate uh, and get into a, a spinal or epidural position. So I would be careful for that. Uh, but it is possible, it seems. I, I have no experience on that. I have used it, um, but only two or two, three times that we used uh, our shamrock view uh, to uh, put in a lumbar plexus, uh, mostly for people uh, um, who really need it. So not for total hip arthroplasty, but for extensive uh, hip surgery in complicated patients. Uh, and we did it a couple of times in, in a kit uh, who had uh, multiple uh, multi-level surgery at the hip, uh, which had cerebral palsy uh, and, and uh, it's very extensive surgery. And there it's actually, it worked uh, and that was really nice. And it's also not as deep in, in children. So um, uh, we used the normal dose, which we usually use, which is uh, or 0 0.375, but I don't like mixing that much. But I think it's one of the safest concentration uh, or 0 0.5. Usually we use a ropivacin uh, and for a working block, I would say 20 milliliters is okay with any of those concentrations. Maybe I can answer these questions also. We do a lot of uh, transmuscular quadratus lumborums uh, with catheters mainly for hip revisions. And the charm of this kind of approach is that you place your needle far away from the from the surgical site. If you yeah. do a fascia iliaca you are, or you do a pen block, you are close to the surgical close. site. And some, I knew some colleagues uh, where the orthopedists don't want to do uh, a block in this area. And Steve, what are you doing for hip revisions? Uh, actually, for hip revisions, uh, we're, we're using a uh, fascia iliaca block, uh, so a uh, supra-inguinal, yeah. Uh, mm, but we okay. usually only do a single shot there and may, may be a repeat block because we have no experience uh, with catheters there. But it, it, it's a good idea to maybe try that for, uh, for catheters. It's a good idea, Paul. Um, uh, I have a question here uh, on 
concentration for fascia iliaca block. Well, we used very low concentration. Uh, that means 0 0.25. And we even tried 0 0.125. Uh, and uh, we still saw a motor blockade. Uh, actually, after you do a supra inguinal fascia aliaca block, if you do it right and you do it nicely and you see the bow tie, after you've done that, you actually should, and that's what we usually do, go to a femoral nerve and look at that. And you'll actually see that the local anesthetic is right alongside the whole femoral nerve. You can see the femoral nerve almost as good as you saw in my uh, video there. That means that a lot of the local anesthetic goes next to the femoral cutaneous, maybe to the obturator, but also to the femoral, and you always have motor block. So yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about that. So fascia aleca block, although it's not extensive, it gives motor block. Yeah. There's another question, lumbar plexus block. Have you experienced seeing the lumbar plexus in ultrasound, but on nerve stim does not produce twitch? Absolutely, yes. not only for lumbar, but also for the uh, for the, the proximal sciatic nerve block. It always depends. You know, these are mixed nerves with uh, motor and uh, uh, sensory fibers. And if you are in a place where you have only sensory fibers, you cannot stimulate and you cannot uh, elucid a motor response. And this you can see absolutely when you uh, 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 advance the needle to the lumbar plexus, but also to the proximal sciatic nerve. Sometimes to, to change the, the needle a little bit, you go on, a, on the other end or on a, of the nerve, and then you can elucid a, a motor response, and it works very well. But I would always recommend, if you have both, I would more uh, rely on the ultrasound. Uh, I have a question on the, on the catheters. What about catheters on the ward? It is, of course, uh, risky. Uh, I, I think you can only put in catheters uh, when you have an experienced team uh, and you have lots, lots of uh, uh, good uh, quality control, you have a, an acute pain service uh, which uh, does regular controls and also your uh, nurses at the wards know what they're doing. Uh, you're absolutely right. If you're working in a hospital who has no experience with catheters, you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, I think only uh, uh, hospitals with a lot of experience and good um, good experience there uh, uh, can put in catheters and, and, and don't have any problems. So you're right there. There's another question. Can you use these regional techniques as a sole anesthetic technique, I think, uh, regarding hip uh, arthroplasty? We are doing, I can answer, uh, uh, we do it sometimes when we have a patient where we want to avoid a general anesthesia and where we cannot do a neuraxial block because of the anticoagulation. Sometimes we do in these kinds, you can do a femoral nerve block, you can do an operator, you can do a fascia iliaca, but you have to add also a proximal sciatic nerve block. Yeah. And then you can do, it is a combination of two or three blocks, you can do, uh, use this as a sole anesthetic technique, but it's not our standard, it's only the exception when we cannot do other things. Yeah. What is your comment on this? Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're right on that. It's it's exceptional, <clears throat> and um, I think it's only for those select patients. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of questions. Question. Eh? I can't answer them all. I think. <laughs> What is the best management for accidental intraneural injection, which cause a uh, nerve yeah. damage? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't it, understand the question. Best management if you already had it or, or uh, best management to avoid it? Uh, I think uh, uh, accidental means uh, you don't see it on the ultrasound. You can see it only postoperatively when the patient had a a uh, nerve palsy or a motor yeah. weakness. I think uh, what we do in our, uh, or what we recommend is we, if this is not the case, then we uh, ask our neurologists and we check this and only later on in this acute situation, you cannot do anything except it would be a hematoma. You can evade the hematoma, but if there is nothing else and indeed an intra uh, neural injection, you have to wait and you have to check some neurological tests uh, later on. So, next. So, sorry, guys. I think 
to our today's webinar is such a great draw and uh, <laughs> the, it seems like the QI section is overloaded. Uh, yeah, it's overloaded. Please, please understand that. To, uh, yeah, yeah, Dr. Copeland is try to quite answer busy some, today. Uh, typing as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah maybe we pick uh, like uh, five questions. Okay. Uh, um, I think in my experience, LIA plus dexamethasone is comparable to PENG or femoral nerve block or fascia aviaca block. Uh, for uh, total hip arthroplasty, yes, I think so. Uh, but again, uh, it is because our surgeon knows how to do LIA and high uh, dose of dexamethasone is actually a very good painkiller. So I think yes. I don't understand some questions. While using catheters, what do you suggest regarding frequency of dosing? Oh, I, I think, I think they, they mean bolus or, uh, or continuous or, or both or PEEP. Okay. Yes, if you have a catheter, you have three options to, to, to run these catheters. You can give an inter continuous infusion, you can give an intermittent bolus, or you can use a patient-controlled uh, analgesia. I think we know patient-controlled analgesia with a, a bolus uh, background infusion and with top-ups of the patient, this is the best option, and you have the lowest amount of local anesthetics that you inject. And you can adjust all these uh, patient control mode to the needs of the patient. And if you have a con continuous infusion or if you keep top ups, uh, this is not uh, uh, according to the patient's need. But uh, a patient uh, PCR pump needs a pump. You can use reusable or single use pumps. And if you have a, a give intermittent uh, bolus, this is, I think, the most, uh, the, the cheapest uh, technique to run a catheter. I answered so, a couple of uh, by typing as well. I have an operation. I anesthesia by sciatic femoral nerve block as sole anesthesia. It was amazing. It done slowly anesthesia for amputation. Yes, of, of course, absolutely. You can do it. Yeah, yeah. I have a, uh, a question to you, uh, Steve. Uh, you have shown the difficult case of the femoral nerve video. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in this case, we uh, did you add the nerve stimulation to detect the nerve, or did you it's yeah. only by ultrasound? No, I, I, we usually put on uh, uh, neurostimulation as well uh, to use as a negative marker because if we get too close, uh, then then we withdraw the needle. Yeah. So we always use dual uh, combination. Yeah. Yes, and this is also very important for our. Uh, uh, for our uh, followers, if you have a difficult anatomical situation and you don't see very, really nice the target, the nerves, then you can always, for any kind of block, you can add your nerve stimulation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh, still indispensable uh, and uh, uh, we really teach that our fellows as well uh, and actually the last fellow who just uh, left us, uh, Jackie Corpus, uh, he received a, a neurostimulator from me to take home, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which will be used very wisely, I think. Uh, and, and, and I ac uh, absolutely agree with you, Paul. Uh, I think you, you need dual monitoring to be, to be very safe. Hmm. There's a question. My patient has almost two months motor weakness and sensory dysfunction after an endoscaline block during injection patient felt severe pain, what happens actually and what is the prognosis? Steve, Ooh. will you answer? Yeah. During injection is always an uh, Yeah, it's very bad. You yeah. should stop and no uh, continue with injection. Yeah. If you have severe pain, immediately stop. Uh, interscaling actually, when I usually tell the patient when I do an interscaling that the first milliliter, they will feel pressure. Uh, uh, and uh, if you don't say that, they can sometimes because that pressure is also a little bit painful uh, and you really, okay, uh, so you have to distinguish that. But if they have really hard pain, immediately stop with, with injecting. But it could be already that the damage is done by that uh, time. Uh, and actually, uh, what is the prognosis? You, you can't know. You just have to follow up. Uh, it could be it could be permanent. It could uh, take uh, three months, six months, a year, uh, and maybe more. So um, follow up uh, explanation. Uh, it's a difficult situation. 
and you have we have to keep in mind that the interscaline area where we have nerve roots without any connective tissue this is the area where we have the highest rate of nerve damages because we have no connective tissue if you uh, if you touch the needle the root this sh you should always avoid any kind of needle nerve contact in this area in more distal when you have connective tissues and you have uh, per peripheral nerves maybe you can touch the nerve without any uh, serious uh, consequences but in the in the scalene area you should always avoid any needle nerve contact the interscaling is still one of the most difficult blocks and, and especially yes. with the ultrasound you can see the, the the dorsal scapular nerve you can see the long thoracic nerve there's so many nerves uh, and and it's uh, sometimes people think that this is c5 c C6 and C7, again, like with my femoral nerve, uh, pictures from the internet, there are actually pictures on the internet which misguidedly say that uh, a, a split C6 is C6 and C7. Uh, if there are uh, idiots who try to go in between C6 and C7, they will uh, actually go into the root of C6 uh, and, 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 and you get these disastrous results like uh, uh, Paul uh, demonstrated where you get catheters uh, which go into epidural uh, mm -hmm. space or or even into the nerve. So be very careful with that. Know your anatomy. Yeah? Yeah, yes. There's a question. Is there a role of perineural dexamethasone for elongation of the block? As I have showed you, you can use it, but you have a similar effect if you give dexamethasone yeah. intravenously. And this uh, uh, perineurally is off-label. And it's I would recommend, if you, if you, I would always recommend if you, want to uh, extend your block with dexamethasone, give it intravenously. Yeah. I think now we... Uh, scholarships yes. for uh, for doctors in developing country, I, I, I would write to the Ezra or, or, or uh, any of those uh, bigger uh, scientific, uh, they, they can sometimes help you with that. Okay, I think... Oh, yes, I think, I think we have, we have already that. covered yeah. most of the questions. A and, lot of uh, questions. <laughs> very <yeah>. popular. <laughs> it's okay. very well received yeah. yes. by Thank our you. lovely audiences. Yeah, so sorry, guys, maybe we cannot cover all the questions today because um, you notice that uh, Dr. Corbin's still in working status and wearing the, the surgery gown. And uh, we do appreciate your, your time and to support the regional anesthesia community and I'm to going share to your knowledge. Now. <laughs> yeah, really, sh and I really appreciate your efforts, Paul Councillor. And uh, uh, oh, by the way, for for the audiences who participate in all the six webinars in this series, later on we will grant you a, a digital special certificate and sent you by email. So make sure to check your email later and uh, stay tuned with with Sonic Dandelion College. And uh, see you, you next Sonic. time. Thank yeah, you. stay tuned. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you also. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Nick. Bye bye. Bye bye. Steve. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, bye. bye Steve.